time for our panel to have a discussion and then also get you all involved in that discussion at the very end. Um, so this is the second half of the imaging session. Um, it will be a panel discussion with the four folks that I have up here. Um, it's going to be structured with the first part being short presentations from those four um, panelists. Um, there will then be a moderated discussion, and, and we'll finish that up with um, questions from the audience to continue that discussion. So please think about um, some questions you have for our panelists and for the community to discuss imaging. Um, so that at the end we have kind of this full um, discussion um, for this. Um, so last year we had an imaging session that felt pretty successful and full. Um, so it's really great to bring together some of these presentations. So we see imaging within the different specialty groups. And um, I'm a little bit biased as an imaging specialist and not a conservator that I do um, want to pull these imaging sessions together so that I can see them. Unfortunately, I've been sitting up here, which is not the best seat in the house. Um, but it is really amazing to bring together um, some of these presenters. So the first half was three presentations. The second half is going to be a panel discussion, um, which I think was missing from last year's uh, imaging session. So I think there's um, a lot of advances in computing and digital imaging, and those are continuing to int introduce new techniques and technologies and increase the capabilities and applications of existing techniques. So it's important to continue to discuss the available techniques, applications, and challenges. Um, and as I was previously saying, I think that the, um, the session last year was successful, but I think the thing that was missing uh, was a panel discussion. Um, so I wanted to start out with um, introducing something that I've kind of identified with some of the research that I'm doing. I don't think it's anything new. I don't think it's necessarily changing what we're doing, but it's looking at um, and identifying three categories of imaging within um, museum imaging. So those are um, collections, photography, conservation documentation, and scientific imaging. So I think these areas are defined by different techniques, workflows, and applications, but they're interrelated and overlapped. And I think that this looks, um, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So museum imaging incorporates interdisciplinary cultural heritage documentation and contributions from many fields for the continued development of imaging techniques and technologies. And so I don't think that these are always clearly defined independently, and they may not exist in all institutions. So the organizational structure influences the dynamics and the connections of these categories. So part of categorizing the museum imaging is looking at techniques, applications, best practices, and standards uh, for each to understand how these currently relate and overlap, and how they can be developed and implemented in future applications and research. So another part of defining these categories is working to understand how imaging is served and accessed by departments and units of the museum, specifically conservation. So presenting the structure of the museum imaging acknowledges the contributions from those many fields and the continued development of the techniques and technologies. And it provides evidence of this multi and interdisciplinary nature of the cultural heritage documentation that we're using. Um, so I think there's this interesting and challenging dynamic between some of the fields and how they come together um, for the heritage documentation. So the panel discussion is focusing on accessibility of imaging techniques for conservation documentation, with panelists providing examples of institutional structure and the support of imaging within different institutions and organizations. It also look at case studies of accessible techniques and practice and a perspective of the assessment of available imaging tools and techniques to better understand possibilities and limitations, especially relating to these accessible techniques. Um, so the panel is going to include short presentations from the four panelists, followed by a moderated discussion, and then questions from you in the audience. So we'll start out um, with a short presentation um, from JJ Chen, who is at the State University of New York College at Buffalo. Good 
Beth, can, can you hear me? Okay. Um, well, first, thank you, Keith, for putting this panel together. Um, it's uh, an honor to be here to share my experience with you. Um, and my goal today is to try to give you a glimpse of the conservation image training at my department within eight minutes. Before I introduce the current curriculum, I would like to recognize two pioneers who has shaped the current um, training. First, second to none is Jeldon Keck. Right at the founding year of the Cooperstown program in 1970, Sheldon allocated laboratory space for photo documentation and implemented technical examination and documentation as a standalone semester long course, setting a path for a great tradition. The next important pioneer who needs no introduction is Professor Emeritus Dean Kershaw. <laughs> Over his 34 years of teaching from 1978 to um, 2012, from Cooperstown, Cooper, oh, sorry, Cooperstown to Buffalo, then has shaped technical examination and documentation into a comprehensive four semester curriculum, which is unique among all conservation training programs. Technical examination and documentation, or conservation imaging that I call it now, is integrated into every project and research each student carried out. Dense teaching and mentoring Mentoring was always aimed to help students to de develop a high level of competency in technical and scientific photography, to enable students to work independently, to adapt easily to different photography environments, and to continue to develop um, documentation skills, a philosophy that I carry to this day. The topics that I teach today is a direct transfer from dance curriculum with some updates. The techniques cover range from visible light um, to invisible wavelengths, including UV, X-rays, and infrared. The curriculum starts with students learning how to use a regular camera to document three artifacts, one from each of the three specialties, paper, paintings, and objects. Then advance to learning multimodal imaging with a modified camera. The techniques with these two types of cameras are going to be the most affordable and I make sure that all students become very profi proficient in applying these techniques to as many projects as possible. I cover all the techniques this in the right box with the goal that students know when to use these techniques and what they can do. They may not use these techniques for every project. When I teach visible light photography with a regular DSLR camera, I use to to teach students how to use all the tools and equipment properly and efficiently, I emphasize on um, differentiating different types of lights and how to shape and control them to bring out the characteristics of the materials or condition of the artifacts. From common lighting, techniques illustrated in this slide, normal raking, axial, and oblique specular lighting, or a special transmit lighting technique to bring out the compromised weave of basket, seen on the left, the irregular sheen of painting in the middle, and the theory surface of a decorative mat on the left. Moving on to the second semester, I introduce techniques that can be done with the modified UV Viz IR camera. These type of cameras can capture wavelengths from UVA visible to near infrared. Techniques can be used are illustrated here. I use the term multimodal imaging instead of multispectra because these techniques, these images are taken with different modes of photography, such as the refract mode seen in black letter. It's hard to see from here. Um, for instance, the luminous mode in blue letters and transmit mode in yellow letters. Examining and discussing the, discussing the set of images taken with modified camera with my students is very gratifying. They see what they can, they were not able to record with a regular camera. For instance, the student took, once the student took these images, notice that the white coloring does not respond to different wavelengths consistently. The area that falls is yellow green, like we painted with zinc white, does not all absorb UVA. And only particular white area emits IR when excited by visible light. She realized that there is more than one white color used. She combined these three images together to create a false color image and found that there are possible three different types of white. And she has a color map now for further analysis. I tell my students often 
that they are kings and queens when they are in the imaging studio doing photography. No one will follow them, and they should spend the quality time with their artifacts. But also believe that conservation imaging does not need to take a lot of time either. I create illustrations to help students to setting up lights for different techniques consistently. These illustrations are also a reminder for them that they should create something like this in the future. I also summarize the imaging capture and plastic steps in one sheet, serving as a quick reference. After students learn the techniques through a detailed instructional manual, I found students generally like to refer to this one page reference instead of going through a multi page document. And I will do that too. The illustrations and the quick reference also help to streamline the process and to improve efficiency. Moving on to Shore IR photography. There are different Shore IR images available for conservators. In gas imagery is usually the most affordable. When Dan was researching which IR imager to replace the old Vidicon, he decided to go for a more expensive INSPI IR imager because it's wider range of IR sensitivity. I'm going to spend the extra money. This, in this imager has a sensitivity range from 1,000 to 5,000 nanometer with a set of five filters this here. I have found that the filter that passing 2,050 to 26 nanometers sometimes allow the imager to capture the underpainting better than the other filters. As you can see, you also have an image there. The 2050 to 2600 nanometer filter is also the only filter that I know and I observe enables the imager to distinguish silver inlay from the heavily corroded iron, mat iron matrix. I cannot end the talk without Bragging about the department's radiography capacity, then has strengthened our radiography capacity through the years, including getting a CR system in 2007 and how to upgrade it to the current version in 2014. With two different X ray tubes and two carbon 14 beta plates, I can teach radiographic techniques using 5kV to 300kV and teaching beta radiography, electron emission, and electron transmission transmission techniques. Just like our IR imagers' um, wider capacity, the different radiographic techniques let students to see different facets of artifacts. In short, learning different imaging techniques is like collecting different tools. Some tools are for daily use, easy to use, and not expensive. Some tools are expensive, but you do need them for special jobs. My job is to research and test imaging techniques available and show the students what are possible and useful. My sincere gratitude to Dan uh, for his mentoring and support and for going over with me the history and development of the curriculum um, on my program. I'm grateful for my students who are so talented and eager to learn. I'm so <laughs> they pushed me actually to be a better teacher. And thank you for listening. So next we're going to have Betsy Hahn from the Library of Congress. I'd like to thank Keats for inviting me on this panel today. And my presentation is just going to be really about the setup that we have. Um, so until 2002, the Conservation Division at the Library of Congress had a dedicated professional photographer who took treatment documentation, photographs for the conservators. After she retired, all Conservation, conservation Division staff were required to take their own photographs. Uh, previously, we had one photo studio with two distinct areas for photo documentation, one for three-dimensional objects like books, and a coffee stand for flat paper and photographic objects. Most of the photo documentation was captured using 35 millimeter color slide film, but we also had the capability to capture images with 4x5 color and black and white film. After our photographer retired, the acquisition and assembly of equipment for photo documentation was haphazard at best. 
In 2008, senior photograph conservator Dana Hemingway asked the Conservation Division's administration permission to form a committee to address the lab's photo documentation needs. In turn, the administration requested that Dana transform the photo documentation setup from analog to digital. Our newly formed image documentation, known as the IDOC Committee, additionally wanted to institute a more coordinated approach toward purchases of photographic equipment for the Conservation Division. <clears throat> buy-in from the administration was not difficult, but buy-in from the Library of Congress IT department was. Dana, seen here in the center, worked closely with the IT specialists assigned to the Conservation Division to ensure this buy-in. It took several years for our photo do documentation to go digital, in part because it took a long time for the IT pieces to come together. For instance, there is a lengthy, lengthy review at the Library of Congress for purchasing software because for security reasons, they must test all new software for the entire library. Um, after our software was tested by the IT department, Dana was then required to test it, so that process took about one year. Once the software testing was completed, the IDOT committee was formed. It consisted of approximately eight conservators, conservation technicians, and interns, and in short order, the committee started developing the workflow manual. In any given year, there are approximately 40 conservation division staff comprised of conservators, preservation specialists, conservation technicians, and interns that use image documentation for conservation treatment photos to capture condition of artifacts for various purposes like exhibitions and loans, and for good quality images of objects to affix to housings. The photographic and computer literacy capabilities of our staff varied widely. In addition, there was a lot of new information for the staff to learn with the change to digital. Therefore, the manual that you can see here was geared toward those with the, latest, with the least experience to ensure overall success. To accomplish the task of devising a thorough and user-friendly manual, each IDOC member was assigned a section to write. The committee also addressed the different needs of the users, like those of a book conservator with 3D objects, as compared to a paper conservator with flat objects. And the manual is based on training that our committee members received in their graduate training programs, training provided to us by outside experts like JJ, and the AIC Guide to Digital Photography and Conservation Documentation. After the manual was thoroughly tested and edited, the new digital phot photographic procedures were introduced to the staff. To provide an air of authority, these sessions were taught by an outside professional photographer, and these training sessions and subsequent benchmarks were, were required for all Conservation Division staff. This process was long and carefully orchestrated. Uh, this is how our photo studio looks now, uh, with one area for image capture. After the digital image workflow was instituted, issues arose such as consistency of before and after treatment images, varying skill levels, and changes to the setup due to use by multiple staff. To address these concerns, the committee instituted rotating members known as eye doctors and specialists. Uh, the eye doctors address general issues and the specialists address more specialized issues like multimodality imaging. When we first started using the digital workflow, we still had one area for books and three-dimensional objects and the copy stand for flat paper objects, but recently these two areas were combined on the copy stand using rolled paper attached to the bottom that can be pulled up to create a suite for 3D objects. And to maintain consistency, there is one camera dedicated for books and three-dimensional objects mounted on a tripod, and another camera for flat objects and page openings that is mounted to the copy stand. After image capture is complete, image processing is done in a separate room that has two networked um, computers with self-calibrating monitors. Our digital imaging workflow also, is also equipped with multi-modality capabilities. Um, this painting is from the Huejo Cinco Codex, and it was made by indigenous Mexican scribes in 1531 for the legal case brought by conquistador Hernan Cortez against the High Court in Mexico. It is painted with indigenous colorants on a substrate made from pounded agave fibers. I am currently conducting material research on this manuscript and have used these multimodality images 
in conjunction with other analytical techniques to characterize the colorants and the substrates. So before I conclude, I'd like to make a few comments about our particular setup. So the development of the IDOC committee took a significant amount of Conservation Division staff time, and this meant that the conservators and conservation technicians took time away from their normal work duties of conservation treatment and housing of collections. Management and staff should consider the loss of productivity when implementing such a program. The manual needs constant updating when we get new equipment and software, and we're now on our third edition. And while we have this manual for the staff, I have to emphasize that it's actually up to the user to follow it. Since we can't enforce the use of a manual, we see a lot of variation. Uh, image processing in particular can fall by the wayside. Some users fail to process their images, so they stay as proprietary files that are not in an archival format and are not universally accessible. We had outside training for digital photography, multimodality imaging, and digital asset management. We also investigated Lightroom, but determined that it would not work for our lab. Our workflow is project-based, and each user has permission to work only in the project folders they've been assigned. With Lightroom, every user would have access to everyone else's images in one catalog, and the risk of unintentional changes was too high. Currently, our documentation is not easily searchable. Our images are stored by project number and individual folders and are not easily searchable by keyword. A strong digital imaging program would incorporate the imaging component with a collections management database, and this requires administration buy-in and funding. In conclusion, we've shared copies of our workflow with other labs and conservators when asked, but I'm happy to announce that the latest edition of our in-house digital imaging workflow is now available on the Library of Congress's Preservation Directorate website. Thank you. So I'm going to be speaking sort of less about how we do things, but why we do things. And um, many of you have heard me talk about our, our data-based conservation management program, data-driven management program. And so what we're trying to do there is to collect data on the rate of change in all of our objects. So we have the two Adobe homes, we have, of course, all of Keith's artwork for personal effects, for costumes, and so on. And, and basically we're taking the stance that if the rate of change um, is slow, then the object is able to withstand the setting it's in, but if the rate of change starts to change, then um, the object is no longer able to, to um, put up with the condition that it's in and we have to make a change. So we're using multi-modal um, imaging, we're using RTI. Um, in this case, we're using transmitted IR to track the um, presence and growth of cracks in paintings. Um, we're using photometric stereos. So we're using a bunch of techniques, but the reason behind doing that is to try and create a series of standard protocols, standard imaging capture protocols, and standard processing protocols, so that regardless of sort of camera used and the resolution that we're taking, there will always be a standard in the calibration that we can compare later on to try and establish rate of change, whether it's chemical, physical, or mechanical. So for us, the heritage conservation and, and um, digital imaging, imaging paradigm is changing a bit. And originally, um, of course, we waited until we saw visible damage and then the conservation process began. Now we have the capacity using the microprocessor and, and the photo sensor to begin to see changes that are not visible with the naked eye. So the, the impact of this is that um, we're, we're actually able to establish rate of change, thereby really measuring quantitatively whether our conservation interventions, our treatments and our preventive methods are actually slowing the rate of deterioration. Up to now, we hope they have. We're using co conservation documentation to evaluate that, but I think with the advent of multimodal imaging, multispectral imaging, 
um, we can actually begin to uh, at least quantify that information in a way that's meaningful to rate of change. So the things that we're using um, include reflect, uh, reflected and transmitted infrared uh, digital photography, um, obviously UV induced visible luminescence, narrow band, band pass uh, filtered visible and UV induced visible luminescence looking at very small band passes um, through um, both types of luminescence to try and detect changes in um, chemistry of the surface of the object, obviously photometric stereo and RTI to create uh, 3D normal surface maps, photogrammetry for the capture of the contours of our historic homes and studios, both at Abiquiu and the Ghost Ranch, and most, most recently, laser Doppler vibrometry to sort of begin to understand the resonant frequencies that objects vibrate at and, and where their stress and strain points are. So um, just to go through some of these, this is RTI and photo stereo. You recognize the removal of the color channel uh, and the creation of a normal vector map. Um, this is in, in the evaluation of carboxylate soaps that are emerging from the surface. In this case, these are lead carboxylate soaps. You'll see the um, false color RGB normal surface vector map. And what those colors represent is real data. And the real data is the normal vector map you're seeing here on three actual micro lead micro protrusions on that surface. So we can come back, take another series of um, photo stereo images, create another normal vector map, register those photographs, and then check the rate of growth of those soaps, whether there are more of them, whether they've gotten bigger, if they've stayed the same. Photogrammetry, many of you are familiar with. This is how we capture our buildings. We create a point cloud that moves into a 3D model. And just to give you an idea of what we can do with that, this is a sparse point cloud um, video that we've taken of the Abiquiu house and studio, um, starting with um, captures um, from a drone, getting the upper area, looking at the outside of the house. This is a hand-built adobe house. So, it's not made with industrial materials. The surfaces are hand modeled, if you will. There are curves and undulations that we would want to both document and preserve in the case of deterioration. Here we're going into O'Keeffe's studio. You can see that we've captured the roof figures um, and their dimensionality, their hand carved. Um, some of the built-in features are going to O'Keeffe's bedroom. Again, the figures in the ceiling are visible. The textures of the mud plaster adobe walls going on the outside. Um, and looking at those plaster walls, we're going to be going back into the driveway area. So you can see that we actually get soil contours using this method so that we can keep track of erosion around the buildings as well as soil buildup. Um, going in the central courtyard, then we'll be moving into O'Keeffe's living room. Um, so there are a lot of built-in furnishing features in O'Keeffe's living room, and so we have complete modeling of that. So this is a three-dimensional three way of recording condition, recording present state, and again, it allows us to isolate any of these areas and check them against dimensional changes that might be occurring. And that's kind of fun, right, to get the sparse point cloud and fly through it, if you will. So we'll go back up, see the reflected root plan, and we're back out. This is multi-point laser vibrometry. It's about so extending the line my friend, the on this line talking about this video. What this is taking a series is of Graded what the infrared would do um, lasers to a crate, and each laser so projector also has a collection lens what is the sensor. Interaction between it these measures the frequency of the laser coming back the to the surface. The so as the surface vibrates, it as it moves away from the vibrometer, the wavelength gets smaller, and as the vibrometer measures that, the more the surface vibrates I think towards the vibrometer, the wavelength it's increases, amazing. I gets shorter. When the ground first told you, measure the vibration of paintings both as a painting handle, transportation crate, trolley, or an A frame. And then we put paintings inside crates, cut observation windows, create a grid, and we're able to measure vibration of paintings in transit. What kind of those pictures are measuring vibration of paintings during transportation? I understand that's essentially a camera, a camera, but we're measuring changes in the wavelength. And we're able to check out such things like, so this is actually data that is visualized. This is the one-one drum mode or a single drum mode where the middle of the painting is vibrating. This is from a, a very small vibration impact. The movement is exaggerated for the sake of the video, um, but we can actually measure acceleration, displacement, and um, acceleration, displacement, and velocity of each point in that grid. 
Now, these are two vibrometry readings. Are they moving? Oh, it's starting. It's trying. So in a crate, essentially. And what you're seeing on the top is the double drum mode, so uh, uh, two side-by-side -side motions of an actual O'Keefe painting as it's moving. That's the vibration that the painting undergoes at 23 hertz. The one below it is about 45 hertz. And that's a triple drum mode. So the canvases are moving, and we're able to visualize that and load that data. The impact of that is that if a painting becomes additionally cracked, if a crack becomes open, then the vibration profile of that painting in that area changes. And we will be able to see if that crack is active or if it's stabilized and if a change occurs over time. Those are sort of the latest things we're doing to try and record the rate of change. Thank you. Thank you, Keats. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to try and go very quickly through a very dense pack of slides. Uh, I'm from the Net Imaging Department, and I run the Advanced Imaging Team. It's a big operation, and we're a small group within a big operation. Uh, our photo studio, our imaging department, satisfies the traditional needs of the museum. That's our primary work. Uh, we also extend support, technical support, in my team to many different departments that are doing their own collection photography. And we also support our conservation departments. Uh, they have their own imaging, and we also sometimes do imaging for them. A couple of years ago, we started an advanced imaging initiative, and uh, we are going into really developing best practice around the emerging technologies. Uh, here's a quick sample of something we worked on last year just as a test. Uh, we were looking to do a full painting RTI type capture, but really doing the full piece uh, using 3D scan and photogrammetry. So we scanned the painting. Uh, actually, these were the photogrammetry sessions. And then we uh, laser scanned it. We brought those two data sets together mainly because the laser scan has more precision than the photogrammetry. And working with our photographers, our uh, image and production manager, Wilson Santiago and Juan Trujillo, are looking at the relighting. Uh, that's in a software called Keyshot. And you'll see you can relight and bring up the texture of that's just the mesh. This is the addition of the high quality texture. And then you can relight it. Um, this is, again, something we haven't formally pursued, but it definitely was a repeatable technique. And you'll see another example of this. Most of our projects, our real projects, are for conservation departments. But the reason I'm here today and I'm happy to be on this panel is look at all the stuff we have to deal with from a technical perspective. All of the tools you use, all of the tools we use, have to work together. Uh, and this is a full-time job. That's why we rely on international standards. Uh, so our museum best practices have to elevate further if the, they'll be of help to everyone. And one of the panels I'm on is uh, ISO Joint Working Group 26, and we were responsible for merging the US and uh, European standards for 2D artwork reproduction. Real quick summary, they shoot a chart. You have a camera's manufacturer profile, it usually looks something like a fail. Um, after calibrating, it looks something like a pass. <laughs> I'm just speeding it up. That's all for a full workshop. Uh, here's something to give you a real world, world example in a large museum where this is helpful. We have our paintings conservation with the Kios 5D at that time using tungsten. And in our photo studio, we have passive light cameras with strobes. They're both ISO validated. There's slight differences between but they both pass. And uh, then if you take spectral measurements off the painting service, you'll see uh, just visually, you can measure the delta E's, but you'll see those uh, color patches just disappear. Um, so we have two departments speaking the same language. 
uh, especially helpful for before and after comparisons. Here we have a, a, a project we did a little while ago. Uh, we have some Almer pieces, which are fantastic for people into color. Um, here we're uh, measuring uh, the originals, and then we calibrated the camera, and then we shot the three pieces. The reason we did this is, uh, upon output, the original captures were doing strange things. Uh, we wanted to see well, what the brown tip was. Um, on this projector, in the middle slide, you'll see, or on the corner, the left corner, you'll see three little dots, possibly. Those are the spectral measurements compared to the actual captures. Uh, and they actually do slightly show up, but it actually ends up just being a pinch of exposure, and those, all those colors drop brightly. Um, that's attributable to the flare. This is the most interesting set of slides, though. This is if you do not follow ISO capture practices, how wildly different your images will be. Um, and I think the passport is not enough for this level of precision. But here you'll see the net color differences. And I, I can give you a Delta E report, but the visual assessment is really comforting to people that aren't technical. Um, here's another one that hits everyone, and uh, uh, some people have tried to grapple with this, and that's microscope calibration. Um, this was a quick test for photo conservation or a quick repair job. Uh, this was a, just a piece of paper on the desk. Here's a, we photographed the chart and made a profile, and you'll see the vast difference. The one on the right is actually the color of that object. Um, well, it really flew through, but that's okay. Here's the, uh, the bottom line is advanced imaging is based on traditional imaging. Traditional imaging is not going away. A uh, 100 megapixel camera is a much more efficient tool than the technique I showed you of the laser scanning painting, which takes a long time. So uh, until the point where it's superseded, we have to really look at our practice for still imaging, and that includes the multimodal, multispectral imaging, which is essentially a series of pictures. So what's missing are targets and definitions of aims and tolerances. And I wanted to show you how far we've come with 2D because everything's going to build on that and, and that's what we're working on in ISO right now, uh, gathering information about best practice in spectral imaging so we can get some standards wrapped around it. That's it. Um, I've seen some of their work in their studios, I've talked to them at different conferences, and I think that they bring really good examples of either the priorities that we need to be looking at with some of the imaging, like looking at the training that um, JJ is providing within the conservation programs, but also some of the institutional structures that we're seeing in some of these places <laughs> and the standards that we're trying to work towards. So, um, it is really exciting to bring these together to try to start to have this conversation, not even start to have this conversation, this conversation that we've been having, but to continue it in a meaningful way. Um, so I'm going to try to do tech and pull together some questions um, to continue this. So give me one second. That was cool. You totally got it by surprise. I'm sorry, I could have. I could have. <laughs> You could have kept going. <laughs> so I do want to remind you, I'm going to ask a few questions, but please, if you have some questions, come up, write them down, have them in mind, and then we'll invite some audience questions um, at the end of the session. So we're going to start out with um, a question that's kind of a pretty broad question for each of the panelists to think about. So each of these panelists are coming to this discussion from different institutions with different roles and priorities. So there are universal, essential elements for good documentation, and also the interpretation of this through the individual institutions. Can each of you briefly speak to the essential components of good documentation given your individual institutional priorities? And for this question, I think we'll start with JJ and we can move down and then we can switch up the order. You want your slides? Yep. I said that very confidently. 
Uh, for I will coming from the how I evaluate students' uh, image work, um, and I have different categories that I look into when I check their images. And the image is really not a uh, photography; it's not a report, it's actually a document. And so for me, it's very important just from uh, looking at the image, I know what the image is about. Is it how how is it lighted? So that the light indicator can tell me this is like a normal light image or red light image. And also the color reference layer can tell me how the color is rendered or the exposure is correct or not. Let's go to the detail that, that I usually check with 100 percent magnification to make sure the the the, um, the focus is right. Um, the exposure is according to the standard that I can see. Um, and how the color, the color temperature and thing is rendering properly, all, all that. So it's a it's a document and need to have essential information within the image without me going through the metadata. Um, and the consistency also is important if it's for um, for before and after treatment that consistent consistency. It for me, I emphasize a more consistency than a perfect color render image because. I can compare from apple to apple instead of apple to orange. And so the consistency is really the key and that lead to a standard workflow that students can be able to produce consistent documents. Mm -hmm. I can just answer from here. I think at the Library of Congress, it's probably similar to what JJ was talking about, except that we don't have somebody on staff who checks everybody's images. Um, I think that would be more than a full-time job. So for us to have, I think, the best quality image, it really stems from the work that the committee did developing that manual. Again, as I said, not everybody follows it like they're supposed to, but the majority of people do. So if they follow the manual, both for image capture and processing, we should have um, really good quality images for our documentation. I'll jump in. Um, so, when I was first asked this question, or told the question was going to be coming, I, I was thinking, okay, so we, we try and follow both Charisma and FANGI workloads, um, work processes, workflows. Um, we um, try to include uh, a 99% um, spec Speculon standard um, along with the XBrite um, color checker. Um, we're also adding uh, cultural heritage images, um, digital recognizable um, uh, calibration, distance calibration standards in those shots. So we got that when the capability comes along. Um, and then uh, we try and make full use of metadata. So we've been working on a, on a XMP metadata template that includes everything we want, um, along with keywords within the metadata for everything we want. So we're trying to keep track um, in, in the metadata of uh, uh, the illumination source, the color temperature, the brand. Um, we don't keep track of angle. We don't keep track of um, uh, the brightness because um, we think the calibration is going to take care of that. Scott may tell me that I am sorely misled, but um, uh, the, the, the camera modifications, the filters that are being used. Um, and then I went back and I sort of looked, right, how many photographs had all that? And it's, and it's really less than half, right? And, and so what's clear is that there are, within the collection, there are works that travel a lot that we consider to be high risk because of the energy inputs that they're getting from vibration and light and handling and so on, that we really want true um, state of condition, true state rate of deterioration, and that we're going to track that carefully over time. And then there's condition documentation where you know, we need to quickly, somehow, graphically communicate what this thing looks like. And um, so whatever metadata is automatically captured by the camera, because we shoot tethered, goes into the metadata. Um, so I have to say that, that 
sort of internal consistency and um, sort of having time, even though there's only two of us taking photographs, um, is um, something that even we can't do all the time. And, and, and we, we understand we're a special case, right? We have one artist. Um, she is 99.5% of our entire collection. Um, so our attention is all that. And, and, the, and the future of the museum depends entirely on moving that collection into the future. Because if we lose some percentage of the sort of authentic appearance and scholarly quality of O'Keeffe's paintings, nobody's going to come to our museum because we don't have anything else. So we understand that the risk of um, deteriorating our collection is very high and we want to keep as careful track of rate of change as we possibly can. Um, so our desire is very high. Given that though, really less than 50, just less than 50% of the photographs have all the metadata. So um, maybe I'm best case, I don't know. <laughs> but that, that's the reality of what we do. Um, well, that makes sense actually, <laughs> it's a good thing. Uh, you know, each person is coming at this from a different angle and I think it's a good panel because um, there are different scales involved. Um, at the Met, as a large scale operation, we're working in groups of people that are in conservation that are interested in multispectral. Uh, as an example, we're looking at, there's different vintages of cameras, different lenses, different filters, different light sources. So we've looked at it from um, ironing out those differences in equipment as a starting point and using the same tools to process, aiming at standards if they exist. Uh, and we've done this with a sort of a very low budget footprint, not buying new gear, but just corralling the gear we have. Uh, also working with our ICT departments uh, as allies instead of enemies, um, because there are issues with access and, and security that, ha that we have to deal with, like the Lightroom uh, discussion. Um, the, the standards that we speak of are really open to any tools. Um, and I guess our biggest uh, effort, and why I think I wanted to be here, was to say that um, we can push harder on the manufacturers to incorporate this checking for standards and the features we need. Because if you look at all of our struggles to educate on this topic, is that we're fighting against half of your courses on how to unravel Lightroom and how to reverse engineer all the software you use. So if the camera had a scene referred ISO mode, then we can train at the very uh, at the student level. How do you, what are the best practices of capture? But a lot of this, the work we do is just unraveling system and software trouble. So uh, I'd say that's our as a larger institution why we're leaning towards ISO standards and not MET guidelines. I think it needs to be larger than that so we can all funnel it to the manufacturers. So that's that's our our mission, I guess. Well, tying into that. Um... And some of y'all started to answer this, but within the institutions, what are the barriers of, of achieving these essential components of good documentation? You can fight for the mic. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, since any problems I have really are, are my fault, right? There's, there's only two of us. And um, um, so part of it is workload and time. Um, I think a big part of it is, um, is space. So, I mean, I'm so jealous of Library of Congress's space because, um, you know, we, we're essentially shutting down studio space to do photography. And there's bound to be stray light, um, which is something I would love to get rid of, um, particularly for some of the multispectral imaging that we're doing. Um, so, you know, sort of all the usual things that we're all trying to overcome all the time, space, time, um, exhibition deadlines um, and help, yeah. So, but I, I, I agree that um, with Scott that I think our efforts now need to be communal, and that we have to work internationally, and we have to begin creating scientific images that will be meaningful regardless of capture equipment and capture conditions. That there is enough information in that capture and its internal metadata that anybody could reproduce the same setup and have comparable results. I think that's where we need to get to. Um, 
in terms of a challenge for achieving good documentation, um, I think we're lucky because our um, it's an educational um, department, and so the scope of work is more limited, and we usually our objects smaller. We have a good um, studio, and so students usually have good success in terms of achieving consistency. That's usually I try to um, to emphasize that before, during, and after treatment is actually consistent. One thing that I struggle is actually it probably the software issues um, that just she just mentioned that um, I sometimes has changed my work uh, the, the handout um, one semester to another semester because maybe the OS changed and maybe the the uh, app updated and so I need to um, revise the workflow and then sometimes the just the camera version the process version can change and then the rendering the color may be different better measuring the rendering different that's one of the challenges that I am struggling with how can I um, keep consistent when the software or the application is updating and <coughs> Sorry. Every time we get a new camera or any type of new software, it's not just that we get that, but then the committee has to regroup again, rewrite, ev I shouldn't say everything, but a lot of it has to be rewritten. And then we take photographs of the new camera, everything along the way, and it, it is very time consuming. So, yeah, I think JJ's right. New software just creates issues. Um, I think we, this is a big organization. If you look at uh, the still imagers, um, we're more fractured, I think, because of your scientific papers. You know, how many people are here? 1,500 or something like that? About you know, almost every one of you uses a camera, not just people are in this session. Um, I, I think if we can get the organization behind what your requirements are, for systems, and that's starting to flush out. I think we can couple that with other facets of museum professionals and go to the manufacturers with leverage. Because it's all driven by marketing. You know, if a company can feel they're squeezing into our market, once you get one company to add a feature that we need, and we've done it, um, but uh, we need some force multiplying. Um, because this, like I said earlier, all this is building on still imaging a lot of the techniques that you're using. The photogrammetry is a good example. You're talking hundreds of cameras, hundreds of lenses, hundreds of exposure, and it's all in our time. So, you know, everyone wants to sell that camera to you, but uh, we need to sort of say, we need the support for XYZ on our POs. Uh, I think that's the only way to streamline the software, hardware problems. So I think with that, we're hearing the challenges of um, time, space, deadlines, software issues that then tie into kind of time issues. Um, one of the things that hasn't directly come up but is a big issue is budget. Um, Scott was starting to address some of kind of what the solutions are in terms of approaching the manufacturer that would tie into some of the work with the standards, but what are some other um, solutions or resources that we should be looking into or what are some of the most important threads to be following um, to be supporting this community? Um, I can say briefly that, um, you know, we've had, had to go out and um, always, you know, sort of try and find an enthusiastic philanthropist who is going to back acquisition of equipment, materials, filters, and so on. And, um, I found it to be surprisingly easy. If you can make the case that this is incredibly relevant on, a, on an international scale, if we are going to be providing scientific imaging that's going to be shared, searchable, findable, and, and meaningful to um, uh, all the museums that have artwork by George O'Keefe, that they're going to be able to understand their work better and track the condition better, that's the mission of the organization. And uh, my board and other philanthropists get really excited if they can uh, have a major impact um, on the preservation of, um, of this material long term. So I mean, finding, finding international relevance, um, sharing essentially, searchability and sharing 
um, so that other people can take similar images, compare the two, and learn something, I think is, is a real lever when it comes to trying to raise money. Again, I have to say I'm lucky. Um, got the good support from the department. It's got the good support from the co college to supply um, some of the basic equipments and like filters and that usually have no problem to purchase them. Um, and so that's why I say the um, regular camera or the model light camera is the most affordable one and um, that's usually no problem. The, mo the challenge is updating it. Cannot buy a thermal imager, cannot buy a hyperspectral Im imager and that the kind of challenge. Um, um, but also, I think I, because our students are going to go out to the field and work in different institutions, maybe even in private practice, I cannot, require, I cannot anticipate them to have the same type of the, um, Im image, imaging capacity can have in the museum. And so I try to um, just give them um, the, the concept that you can still use low budget, you can, conservators are created um, to use low budget to achieve as high as stand high standards as possible um, may not be the highest quality, but at least it can um, be kind of problem solving. And that's one of the challenges I gave to students is called photo challenge. They have $100 to to spend and what they can do to improve what is the fundamental need instead of what is what they need, not what they want. Um, so think through the problem. Um, but again, budget is always the issue and particularly with have a special imaging, the department I try to kind of um, increase um, to in, expand the curriculum as an expert, but the technology moves so fast. Um, by the time I purchase hundred thousand dollar in three years, maybe there is a better one, and so that's usually a big challenge. And so sharing the resources, I think, it maybe is the way to go for the field for this kind of um, more expensive equipment. Uh, I'll just fill in a couple thoughts there. The uh, one thing is actually it at the Rijksmuseum 2 and 3D conference last week. Um, someone uh, from the UK had done a beautiful presentation on standards and he took a 15-year-old Minolta digital camera and walked through the whole workflow of making it work, the same thing we do. Um, and uh, yeah, you could, you could make any camera pass in terms of color and tone uh, and even resolution. It's pretty amazing. People have done it on iPhones. Uh, so the, it's interesting that the, uh, the goal of reaching it is, is there. Uh, it's, if you've done AIC guidelines, um, it's really the same step. It's just a little more um, checking. It's just checking your work, basically. Um, so from a standards perspective, it actually becomes a little easier than chasing the in-house tolerances. But I wish we could, if there was a... One thing we could do would be great if there was an app or an application that we can use to do our scene referred standard capture that eliminated the need for these consumer tools that we're battling. Um, if someone wanted to write a check, that would be a, a, a tool that we could all share, that type of thing. Um, you know, and, and you could use open source to do this. So it's not really money driven, it's interest driven. Well, I think there's a, I'll let Betsy jump in in just a second, but there's also an accessibility of some of the standards. And so with FADGI, which is the Federal Agency's Digitization Guidelines Initiative, which is used by collections photographers and not as much, I don't think, in conservation documentation, it's not the most approachable document. So it's, it's figuring out how um, resources can become available so that these are more approachable documents in terms of the ISO standard um, and then also kind of FADGI and metamorphose. Would it be helpful to have a workshop at the next day I see on how to do this? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so that's we can start there. Scott, <laughs> did I understand that the Fudge or Metamorphos is only for flat objects, yeah. right? So for um, 3D? Not necessarily. It's, they came out of library space for sure um, and mass digitization, but it happens to be that a well characterized camera. Uh, we do all of our 3D work at the Met with the same color calibrations. Um, it, it's, uh, it really is a way of qualifying your hardware. So if, if, that, if that color is accurate in 2D, you're just changing the shape of your lighting, and especially for photogrammetry, because uh, 3D software is not color managed, so you have to feed it good color, or else you're, 
uh, let's look at it this way, as these technologies come together, we want our still images that we're known for, we want all of those new types of images to exactly match or else it's a sort of a fail. If, uh, if I have an O'Keefe painting that's rendered in 3D and it's a different color, we won't be able to put it out there. So it's, it, it needs to be compatible. Um, so, did I get off track? Sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> and I want to bring up also um, the conservation imaging is not just color rep reproduction. And it's also looking at the texture, the machine, looking at the response in IR, UV, and fluorescence. And so there's a bigger, bigger problem and not just the color uh, management. And um, I sometimes I feel that the images, the breaking specular, actually more informative for me than just a normal life image. But should be just as procedural, I think, if you're comparing over time to get back to that same ranking light. That's still, you know, all these techniques can be spread across more evenly across the world, I think. If, if someone does raking light, that they follow a certain procedure. Though all those things we should look at. Mm -hmm. uh, and the spectral especially. The, the, I, I guess I didn't mean to say color management as the only thing. Uh, when we're talking about this, we're talking about defining a UV target that we all agree on and that is scientifically valid, uh, a t IR targets, paint mixes, all these things that we want to investigate. I think we, we all are sharing the same collections and investigating together. So I, I think for imaging, we should image it in similar ways. So I'm gonna open up the floor to the audience if you have questions. Um, so please come to the mics. Um, if you don't, I think we can also continue to have a discussion with questions from each other and from ourselves, but... Okay. <laughs> There's a herd of people headed to the microphone. While Ariel goes to the microphone, how many of you were at the earlier session here? So, is JP here? So JP Brown dropped an incredible a mind-blowing bomb when he suggested that some of the critical uh, metadata that's particular to a uh, multispectral um, or a, a multispectral subtraction image can be included in a QR code and the QR code can be put in the image and, and you, you will never lose the metadata because it's literally in the image. That's a brilliant idea. I want to investigate that. Thanks, Dale. I'm Ariel O'Connor. I'm an objects conservator at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And I'm a Buffalo graduate from 2009. So Dan was my professor, and Dale as well. Uh, so many fond memories of hundreds of hours in the photo studio uh, trying to achieve that perfect image. And so my question is the opposite of that idea. Uh, right now, in our museum, we have artwork in four separate locations. Quite often, we're responding last minute to gallery interactions, and I find myself with an embarrassing amount of the percentage of the photography I do with this phone right here. And I would like to know how to optimize that reality, because I don't think that will change. And what suggestions do you have for tools and things that we can use that we can pull in from, the, from this perfect ideal world that we all hope to achieve all the time when we have to photograph with this item? I can help you with that. <laughs> um, there's uh, there's uh, free and paid raw apps. Uh, there's also commercial like Lightroom, et cetera, on the phone. Uh, I think if you follow your regular AIC workflow, you know, in terms of the even just the color checker passport in, in the field. Hmm? Well, let's just say you can take the files when you get home if you're collecting in the field. And you, sh you should be able to do very well, but you probably don't want to use the built-in camera app, but use something that um, has a little more control and shoots uh, DNG. And, and then you can bring it into your, uh, whatever your raw workflow is at home. And you, you should be able to improve it uh, and you take it as far as you want. Um, I have tried. You could email me, we could find something. I actually purchased the iPhone just for the purpose that can take raw file. And you have to download some of the um, app because the, um, 
the, the Apple's um, camera app doesn't <coughs> capture your file. You have to really use yeah, it yeah, third, party. third party. And I try, um, and maybe I'm not trying hard enough. The DNG file that I capture, even after adjustment, it's not as good as the the um, Ecamm um, app. Somehow it just doesn't. And maybe I haven't again. I haven't tried enough to to, to, to test, test it. I mean, but if the phone, it's the only thing you have. Yeah. That is good. Um, and they cannot. I can say to myself, I cannot stop them using the phone to do action shots, to do documentation, if that's the only tool they have. But I teach them the difference between the cam good camera and a snapshot, so they understand what they're missing. But if you can remember to not only grab your phone, but grab grab the little X right um, color checker, then it doesn't have to necessarily be in the shot that you're taking. But 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 the color checker needs to be photographed under the same lighting, right? So if you can just get a shot of the color checker under the same lighting that the object is being exhibited in, then that will allow you to go back and calibrate that that photo. One app that you can look at is called Flannel, F-L-A-N-L-L, -L -L, F-L-A-N-N-L, -L, yeah, Flannel. Uh, and that worked pretty well. I think focus and exposure you can override and shoot your tail, like you said. So I think this is where I think as a group, I, we can all help each other to try and test this because I think really need to improve the capacity using the smartphone to do photography to see we, we can get a little better than and so maybe working together to test few apps and to see what will work best. I guess a couple of questions. One is um, how someone sort of mid-career or late career um, can get better knowledge about how to do, do some of these um, uh, setups and also convince their workplace to invest in, in doing it. And it's a little bit like, the, I don't want to say the Library of Congress, but there's a, you know, it's a large lab and they, we have our protocols and they're good ones, but they need to be expanded. And um, so it takes, it, it takes someone having confidence in being able to do it and convince mm -hmm. other people to do it. So I, I like, not a one day workshop, but like many day workshop, Scott, uh, um, thinking that it would require something more, like for someone say, who would, can do good, nor, good regular photography, but needs much more um, knowledge um, to really bring it back home. And do it. So that's so. I'd be interested in something like that. And also, um, we're so I work at Harvard University, and they have a great digital repository. So I don't have to worry about um, our our all our treatment images are uploaded and maintained by an engineer. So I'm very happy about that. Um, and I'm trying to increase the the technical image upload technical images which is not part, or part yet of um, the repertoire that they broadcast. So um, I kind of am wondering um, in the panel how in your institutions the um, accessibility of not just the employees but um, the web-based, you know, web um, your technical images and how far uh, they reach the public say, and how, how you do that, and how the metadata is sh um, shared that way. So. We don't share our conservation treatment photo photographs with the public. We will share them with people when they ask, but it's not something we would, in general, just put up on the web. So these aren't necessarily, I mean, these are, so no to the conservation images unless asked, and the individual re repository approves or uh, allows it, but I'm talking, but technical images are something different. Well, that's true. And so, in, in a way, I'm, so I'm asking, it's more of a question, and 
how how private, how special, how scholarly, like who who had who has access to those? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. so we, for a long time, we had a, a, a website dedicated to our RTI files, so that anybody could go and grab any of our RTI files, right? Um, and um, and get the cultural heritage imaging viewer uploaded and look at the RTI files. And we were really interested because everybody remembers O'Keefe from her posters, basically, and everybody thinks the surfaces are flat, but of course, <laughs> there's a lot of texture that she intentionally put there, and we really wanted to get that information out. Um, since changing websites, we haven't, we haven't brought that back live, but that's, that's the kind of technical imaging that we're perfectly willing to share um, along with our calibrated um, UVs, our IRs, um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking also that our transmitted IRs, because our transmitted IRs show her canvas type and canvas weave and canvas density so well, um, that that's really going to become a useful um, tool that I think we'll be happy to put up. Yeah, treat, treatment photos, I'm not sure that, that the curators will be comfortable with that, but certainly the technical imaging, um, we fully intend for them to live, um, to be accessible via metadata on our dams, and so they should be easy to um, then move right, right onto the web. Um, to answer your first question, <laughs> just hire one of our graduates. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also I think this is something um, the AIC may be doing more workshop on this, like what Scott just mentioned, to offer more help in terms of the documentation, particular digital documentation aspect. Um, second, in terms of the record, we don't actually share our records either, it's only in-house, but I do feel there's a wealth of information from the projects being done by the students through the years. Um, the um, Mellon Foundation funded a conservation space project. The goal, I remember, was actually be able to have different levels sharing the image, but I don't know where the project is going, and it would be great to actually be able to share the images through institutions, particular technical images, and be able to mine the data um, for to collect all this information as a, as, as a profession. Um, I just don't know where that is now. I'll just quickly answer number one. Number two is more of a policy thing, and our, our work does flow out to the public, usually related to an exhibition or a special, uh, I know of a few where the conservation images and work played a big role to the public, but not on a website sort of access as I see. Um, but the education question is interesting. I think, I'm hoping that our institution um, supports our advanced imaging effort of education. Um, again, it could be reaching out through AIC or something like that or something at the museum. Um, but we just did a workshop on all of our 3D work for the first time in Holland and it was 90 people came and really seemed to enjoy it. But it was just such an overview. It was just an introduction. Uh, what you're looking for, uh, it, it's interesting because I think that should be a role of, after all this research and work on standards, maybe we have to help you know, spread the word. I just want to add that I think it's really important that we start within, within our own domain. And that is that we find ways of sharing our images and the capture and processing workflow with each other, with our colleagues, make it accessible to other people who want to try and take the same kind of image and compare the results. We need to find ways to do that um, cross-institutionally so that we, if we can start there, then I think it really builds relevance, builds the case, helps us get funding, helps us get space, everything that we're talking about we need. Hi everybody, I'm Emily Kaplan, uh, National Museum of the American Indian, and I wanted to thank you all for a fantastic panel and the fantastic talks earlier today. And um, just thank you all for uh, helping us, um, not just you Keats, but all of you for, we have um, so many interns and fellows coming through our lab all of the time that um, it really helps to build on the work that's gone before, and especially when we attempt new, uh, new, new formats, new, new techniques. So um, part of my question was 
um, about RTI files. Um, I think across Smithsonian, we're, we're still, all right, I'm flummoxed still about what to do, what, where, where to put, where to store, how to store all of the, the processing files, as well as, say, the, the, really, the really large um, PTMs. That's something that we haven't solved yet. Um, and I love, I think I agree um, overall absolutely with if we, if we all should share our processes. Um, I'm also really happy to hear about this new app for the iPhone, and I'm glad that Ariel brought that up because I was afraid to, but it's true, it's true. We do do that. Um, and another session would be great, and if there's the possibility of, um, you know, when the first, the, the um, AIC guidelines came out, that was enormously helpful. Um, if there could, y'all can do like another edition of that, it would be really helpful too. Um, but I'm, I'm just really grateful for, for all of your work. We couldn't, um, we couldn't do what we do without you. So thank you. Topics to discuss or questions to um, to answer. We also um, talk about the, um, the frustration that it had over years in terms of software update, and it it may be great to have a supporting. I think have a supporting group that people actually constantly do with work, working on upgrade the software or constantly go through a problem to share the solutions. I think that would be great, and so there all may be a working group for the AIC, within the AIC, to support that constant working with the computer and doing imaging to support our colleagues that when they have questions um, about which update, which which version you should use or when you update to certain version, what kind of problem you're gonna encounter, what are the solution to solve the problem. I think um, the other thing we have to think about as, as a domain and as a profession is that um, you know the processes are going to continue to change. Um, the Brooklyn Museum just gave a, dem a demonstration earlier, talk earlier on their um, uh, multispectral subtraction um, uh, system, which in helped really identify in the mixes of paints locations of, of uh, indigo blue, Prussian blue. It's fantastic. That kind of development is going to continue to happen. We're all going to be doing that. It's really fun. And when we think about building standards and building metadata in particular, I think, what, or, or even writing another version of the uh, AIC guide to digital documentation, I think it needs to be online. It has to be live. It has to be easily updatable um, so that we can continue to add. Um, here's a workflow for adding iPhone. Uh, mobile phone applications and, and somehow standardize and make it information rather than just make it entertainment, right? I think that's what we need to do, but we need to, we have to build in the fact that there will be no set group of standards. The standards will be dynamic and we have to adopt that and we have to find a way to get those standards um, broadly dispersed. I agree. <laughs> I had a comment, not a, oh sorry. Uh, not a question. I, I'm Lisa Barrow. I work in photograph conservation at the Met. And I just wanted to mention that um, the material that goes online varies depending on the conservation departments. And I don't know if there's anybody from Paintings Conservation here, but they actually, uh, Paintings Conservation at the Met, they actually, there's a technical notes section on the metmuseum.org, and they've actually put a lot of information online. I made a comment about a month ago, oh, you know, I wish this information was shared, and someone said, this is online, <laughs> inside, and so it's the main, it's the object uh, pages, and technical notes, there's a lot of, inf like, infrared, uh, x-ray, and then other, other multispectral imaging. We're all working, sort of, individually, trying to get conservation information in that technical notes section, but I would say paintings has done, they have a lot of material on there. Hi, I'm Dawn Chris, um, Optics Conservator, about to start at AM&H. Uh, I just wanted to 
sort of continue this discussion a bit um, that JJ touched on and also in relation to what you just mentioned about the Met sharing their technical um, imaging info. You know, as I presented on earlier this afternoon at the Brooklyn Museum, we participated in the APPEAR project and a big part of that project, which is still ongoing, is that you know there are dozens of institutions participating and they're sharing their images on this online database that everyone who's participating in the project is able to view. And that information was so informative and helpful for us in terms of determining what we were interested in looking at and then sort of reaching out to institutions to see you know, what they had found and how they were you know, compiling these results, but even looking at their false color infrared images to try to see if they had identified indigo or if, you know. Um, and again, it was a whole multidisciplinary thing, so they also had their scientific results up in terms of you know, cross-comparing all of these different examples. But I think, you know, it's maybe much too ambitious to envision sharing all these things sort of globally, but I do love this idea of being able to um, share with one another our results of these different um, techniques in certain sort of specific applications. I think it really can go such a long way to further our understanding of particular materials and then even, you know, very specific sort of um, uh, objects and their kind of history and techniques in, in this particular instance. So anyway, I, I just love the idea of really trying to expand our wealth of shared information and having a um, sort of updatable um, set of protocols is like a really great step in that direction. And I think just really trying to standardize things as much as we can and, and discuss ways that are going to be accessible for everyone. I think that's um, definitely one of the challenges, you know, is that Photoshop is so accessible, but it's also so opaque in a lot of ways. And so when you have these software updates, you're sort of scrambling to figure out what has changed and, you know, where do I need to go in and, and sort of what can I do to address that. But I think that communication and having this open line of, you know, being able to discuss this amongst one another is so essential. So anyway, thank you all. I'm very excited that this discussion is taking place and I look forward to seeing how it all progresses. I, I have something that I've been thinking about as you've been speaking because I knew nothing about your project, but I encountered it through our conservators that were working with you. And, and actually that was one of those types of projects that energizes people around, like it's so much to take on, but working on a specific project draws people in, but it also allowed you to collaborate with, I don't know how many, but quite a few, each site. Over a dozen, yeah. Uh, and it's you're almost nice. qualifying the process because you're hitting different cameras and all that. So actually, that's another avenue that I hope there's more of those um, projects that cut across museums based on a type of art, because uh, you know that if you ask them and wrote an online thing and said do it, it, it doesn't always work, you know. But sure. if you're actually working on it together, mm -hmm. it's a whole different scenario. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to state that's another thing that I found to work really well uh, with technology because it, it provides a little focus. Exactly. Because it's so much. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We are fast approaching the end of our time. So what I would like to ask is each of y'all to take a minute or two, no more, to just, if you have some final thoughts, final comments on this discussion, and then we'll wrap it up and hopefully see how the discussion continues within our community um, and further. And just, you know, fight for the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Want to go first? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I, I'll, I think my closing thoughts are um, force multiplying power in numbers. Uh, a good example, a practical example, is if you ask uh, everyone in this room what filters they use for their multimodal imaging, you'll probably have 20 vendor names, and then when you go to buy them, you'll find it's not in your size, or they discontinued it, or it's back ordered for nine months. How about if we scientifically vet? through practical testing and experience, the filters and cutoffs that we actually need. Go to one or two manufacturers with an AIC spec, a spec for bid and say to the manufacturer who just wants a big order, the Met can't order them, you can't order them, but 
if we put in a block of orders for someone to cut some filters, we could have a little wooden box with a multimodal imaging series of filters that fits every camera. But that's the way it has to happen if you want to see it happen in your lifetime. Otherwise, we're going to be scraping away for no matter what we say we want to do. But, but it's power and numbers, it's all it is, and efficiency. So, uh, you know, I think we can lock those down. I think we need to do that. That's a great idea. <laughs> Mind blown again. <laughs> I would only, sort of building on what Don was saying, I think that one of the ways that we can do what JJ was talking about and get to shared resources is these sort of, um, not only um, collaborative works cross institutionally, but complementary. So that um, not all of us has to have every single tool for every single capacity, but we can do uh, deep research, deep dives in a particular type of work um, each of us doing what we do best and, and then, you know, um, getting a lot of work done in a collaborative way. So that's another way of, of generating resources and, and creating great information. So just remember, we don't all have to have the same thing. Um, we just need to be able to share it. Well, I would put out an invitation to any of you if you want to come see what we've done at the library. Um, and also please look at what we have online with our manual. And um, Keats and I had talked about this. I think there should be a working group or a committee within AIC, like they've done with other, like sustainability, just for this, because I think imaging is so fundamental to what we do now as conservators that I think it needs to be more formalized, so. Yeah, I second it, as I mentioned before, the working group. Um, the ICOM CC has a working group of documentation, um, but AIC doesn't have that. And it may not be a specialty group, but a supporting group in a way um, to share information, share our challenges, um, and then maybe someone have a solution right away instead of try to, try to solve, solve it yourself. So, a lot of common themes have come up. It's not just the folks that are up here on the panel. Um, we're running into the same challenges. We're working towards the same kind of direction. Um, the common themes of standardizing practice, working towards accurate, repeatable, and comparable results, and going against these challenges of um, time, budget, space, deadlines. Um, and then we kept on coming back to sharing and collaboration. So I think this was a really great discussion. Um, Thank you so much to the panelists who are here, and then also Anna Serrata um, was consulting on this entire thing, because I am, again, not a conservator, I'm a digital imaging specialist, and so I wanted to make sure that we're having that perspective here too, that it's not just someone else coming in to tell you what you need to be doing, which I'm not doing, um, but that it's a full discussion that we're representing everyone here. So thank you to those folks. And if you have additional thoughts, questions, feedback, um, my email is up here. Um, we do hope to make this available. It was filmed. Um, I don't know how quickly that will be or what kind of challenges we might have with that, but um, it is, I think, an important discussion for the community. So we did um, make sure that it was recorded so that we can potentially get it out to a wider audience. And so we have the sign-up sheet for the working group right here. <laughs> Come on. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Yeah. <laughs>